Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Perhaps a well-known passage for some of you. As you know, we've been going through a, an Advent series. It's, it's a bit of a non-traditional one. I've, I've found out since I announced we were doing an Advent series that uh, there are very specific uh, types of Advent series that, that people are familiar with. I was talking to one pastor, uh, just happened to see him in Starbucks. He was asking, oh, so which topic are you doing this week? And he listed off a number. And I said, well, I'm not doing any of those. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing uh, Christ the Savior. He said, oh, okay, you're doing the non-traditional Advent. And so I said, oh, okay, I guess we are doing the non-traditional traditional Advent. That's, that's great. So, um, but we have been enjoying studying the various aspects of Christ's identity. We looked at him as the Messiah, the promised one. We started the series a number of weeks ago, and then we studied him as the God-man over the course of two weeks, that he is both God and man, the glory of the incarnation. And, and this morning, I'm going to focus in on a passage that, that celebrates his identity as the Savior, that he came as the God-man for a specific purpose, and that was to save his people. And, and I have to admit, my, my heart is full, even in anticipating reading this passage, uh, I've just found this just few verses to be full of glory, and I'm very much looking forward to enjoying it this morning. So if you would read with me, this is God's holy, inerrant word about his son. Let's begin reading in verse 18, the Gospel of Matthew. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. In the mid-1800s, as you know, thousands of desperate men traveled across the country to search for gold in California. It became known as the Gold Rush. Outside of Sacramento, rivers and streams that might appear ordinary on the surface were suddenly anything but ordinary. Underneath those ordinary streams, there was gold to be found. Suddenly, pebbles and rocks that might have escaped notice were being given the most intense scrutiny. Thousands of men with little pans were staring at these little pebbles that otherwise would have gone unnoticed, wondering whether some of them might actually be gold. There was gold to be found in the riverbed. My prayer this morning is that we will examine the birth of Jesus Christ with a similar scrutiny. It is possible, if we're familiar with the Christmas story, for his birth narrative to be something like a river that we might pass by without giving it much of a second glance. But there is goal, there is glory in the details of the birth of Christ. Actually, his birth is recorded as a sort of divine stamp of anticipation for his identity and his mission. His birth 
anticipates his glory. We might say it this way. We are to examine the birth of Christ until we are dazzled by his glory as the divine savior. I think that's the intention of the gospel writers, especially Matthew and Luke, when they chronicle this birth narrative because in the details that might pass unnoticed, in the details of that narrative, there is evidence, there is divine evidence, supernatural evidence of his glory as the divine savior. It's, it's right there for us. It's right there for us under the surface. If we will look and examine and enjoy, and you can imagine those, those 49ers as they glared at these pebbles, that's what I want us to do with this passage. That's what I would encourage you to do as you enjoy Christmas Eve and Christmas Day over the next couple of days. Look at the narratives of the birth of Jesus, and you'll see supernatural evidence of his divine glory as the Savior. That's, that's the goal of Matthew, I think, in writing this passage. So we, we want to do that this morning. We want to look at the passage and enjoy it. So if you would, uh, look down at your Bibles um, as I'm preaching this morning. Examine it. The goal is that we would, we would see some of these nuggets that are right there in front of us. Now, this story, this paragraph, moves in sort of three sections, all right? Uh, three basic sections. I'm sure you noticed them as well. For the first section, uh, we might call the dilemma. Uh, there's a dilemma. It, it starts with this introductory phrase, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, and then we start the story, and there is a dilemma right off the bat. Then there's a dream, and then finally there's a decision. I suspect you can see those same movements in the story. So three movements, and then we'll apply it uh, to ourselves. First, the dilemma. When his mother Mary, it says, had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, this narrator, Matthew, he informs us, what we could also read about in, in Luke, that this child was not the creation of a normal union between a man and a woman. He had a natural mother, but the reality of this human inside her womb was a creation of the power of God, the Holy Spirit, uniting to human flesh the, the, the person of God the Son. This was a, a supernatural miracle that had taken place. We are informed of that by Matthew when he says that this child was from the Holy Spirit. Through the Spirit of God, God had united to God the Son a human nature permanently. And that was why there was a baby growing in Mary's womb. However, we're intended to feel the story from Joseph's perspective. A number of commentators have said Matthew accents Joseph's perspective, while Luke accents Mary's perspective. You might have noticed the difference when you read those two different Gospels. This story is, is meant to be felt from Joseph's perspective, and he doesn't know about the Holy Spirit's role. So if we're going to feel the point of this story, we have to enter, and I've said this in other times we're walking through narratives. The point of narratives in the Bible can only be experienced if you enter into the human experience of the narrative. So you've got to enter into this experience from Joseph's perspective. Joseph is betrothed to a young woman named Mary. Betrothal in that culture was something between engagement and marriage. It could only be broken by divorce. It was legal. And yet it had not reached the place where they come together in marriage. So this was his bride-to-be. So linked to him that only a divorce could separate them. And then he finds out, whether by personal observation or because she informed him, that she is with child. And he is obviously aware that he had nothing to do with that. Therefore, he is likely devastated. We have to also remove, if we're going to feel the drama of this story, our sort of light view of sexual sin. This story assumes a godly view of sexual sin. It assumes the legal view in the law of Moses in which this kind of sin could be punishable by death, was punishable by death. 
that this was a great scandal. It was not, as we might view it in our culture today, as an unfortunate mistake or something that was a, a sad decision that certainly shouldn't affect any major uh, decisions as we move forward in life, that there should be second chances. No, that, that's not, we're not going to feel the point of the story, the theological point, unless we enter into the culture. This was a devastating, a life-changing, a scandalous moment that confronts Joseph unexpectedly because what we see of Mary in Luke would incline us to believe she was a, a marvelously godly individual. And what we see of Joseph here is that he is an incredibly godly individual. So for Joseph, this is a shocking turn of events. This godly, humble, worshipful young woman that he is betrothed to is anticipating marrying. They have a unified view of the glory of God, a desire to honor him. We see that in the Gospels. He is shocked to discover that she has betrayed him. And he doesn't know the rest of the story. Matthew isn't whispering in Joseph's ear yet. It's by the Holy Spirit. All he knows is is what any man would know, this is a devastating betrayal. And now he has a dilemma. Matthew informs us of the dilemma in verse 19. He says, her husband Joseph was a just man and unwilling to put her to shame. I take these to be two different qualities that he is now forced to reconcile. He is just, I don't think probably that means that's why he didn't want to put her to shame. I think his just righteousness was a way of indicating Joseph didn't want to break the law. He didn't even want to have the appearance of having broken the law. And if he married her, it would be assumed that he had committed immorality with her. That would have been the assumption of the culture. Well, yeah, they're coming together. This baby is his. This is his doing. And now his legal reputation, his righteous reputation, is trashed in the community. He's a righteous man. He wants to be seen in an appropriate way as having honored God's law for purity and a true Israelite who is following the code of holiness that God places on his people. He's a just man. And yet, he's a compassionate man. He is very aware that to publicly expose Mary might vindicate himself more fully, but would also expose her possibly to the punishment of the law, certainly to public shame. So he is wrestling with his own righteousness and integrity and his compassion for Mary. It is a dilemma. In his mind, there is no question. She has committed immorality. She has broken the law. She has betrayed him. And yet still, he has compassion towards her. And yet not a kind of compassion that will lead him to abandon his pursuit of righteousness. So what does he do? You can see how you're supposed to feel the dilemma here. This is just a, an ordinary righteous man who's been crushed by a betrayal. What does he do? Well, he makes a resolution that in his mind is the best of a bad scenario. He resolves, it says, if you look on your Bibles, he resolves to divorce her quietly. He's going to divorce her legally. He's going to separate permanently from her. He will not make her his wife. That's the just side of him. And yet he's going to do it quietly. The accusation against Mary, if it comes from anyone, is not going to come from him. He wants her somehow, if she can, to avoid public shame, or perhaps even to avoid the full penalty of the law. So he resolves this. Now, we need to feel this dilemma, and here's why. This solution to the dilemma is the absolute best solution that human ingenuity could come up with. What we're supposed to feel in this story is what happens next in the dream is intended to be a divine interruption to an otherwise natural decision. Here's why that matters. For Joseph to decide to divorce Mary was a natural thing to do. It was a normal thing to do. It was the most obvious. Actually, it was beyond obvious. It was gracious. It was a gracious thing to do. 
It, it wasn't like today where we, we would view this with a, a sort of Hollywood lens on, and, and he kind of overlooks this whole thing, and isn't it good for Joseph? He marries her anyway. We, we kind of cheer for Mary in this, partially because we know she's innocent, but also because of our culture. But in this culture, it was totally natural and normal for Joseph to make this decision. He would be applauded. Wow, what a righteous and merciful man. This here is a, a true son of David. He cares for this woman, but he will not abandon his integrity before the law. This is natural. This is normal. For him to do what he did was abnormal. It was absurd. It wasn't culturally accepted. It was ridiculous. It was scandalous. It was head-scratching. It made no sense unless something divine was going on. You see why? If we don't feel the dilemma, we won't get the point of the passage. The point of the passage is the divine interruption brings a revelation about who this baby is. But we have to first feel that it's normal and natural in this culture for Joseph to divorce this so-called immoral woman so that we'll be surprised when he doesn't do that. The culture would have been surprised. His family would have been surprised. Anybody that knew him would have been surprised. This made no human sense. And that's the point. That's the point. It made no human sense. What's the only explanation for Joseph going through with a the marriage? There is no human explanation for that. Not in this culture. Not under this law. No human explanation. It made no sense. And that's what leads to the second movement of the passage, the dream. He had made this resolution, but as he considered these things in verse 20, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. As with countless times throughout the history of the scriptures, God intervenes into an impossible human dilemma with divine revelation. You can see the pattern of scripture playing out right before this, as long as you feel the severity of the dilemma. For Joseph, this was the dilemma. But now we have God revealing something. He breaks in supernaturally. This is not just an ordinary, disappointing moment in a relationship in Nazareth. This is not what this is. This is a moment when God will reveal something. Now, for Matthew, as with all the biblical writers, referencing an angel is not some sort of religious, mythical uh, reference that, well, something impressive happened. And so we'll call it an angel. No, he, he is talking literally. The, the book of Matthew is literal history. It, it's not apocalyptic literature where it's symbols and so forth. No, it is literal history. He is saying a literal angel, a spiritual being that belongs to the spiritual world, appeared to Joseph. He's saying that literally. He is a historian of the birth of Jesus. And as a historian, he is declaring an angel actually appeared to Joseph. A real angel appeared to Joseph with a message. And his message unfolds in a number of parts. First, he says to Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. There's a lot of reason to be afraid. Joseph could be afraid because he doesn't trust Mary anymore. He could be afraid because of the public scandal. He could be afraid of the loss of his own reputation. He could be afraid that perhaps there is some other person still involved in her life. There's a lot of reasons to be afraid. The angel starts by saying, do not be afraid to take her as your wife. And then he gives the reason for the baby in her womb is from the Holy Spirit. Here's why this is important. A messenger from God is declaring Mary to be carrying a product of divine power and not of human womb, a human union. This human nature inside of Mary is not the product of a human union. He is declaring that this pregnancy is the result of God's direct activity. God has created a baby, and we know that baby to be the very flesh and nature of God the Son. 
God has done something, Joseph. And this revelation is not mere human expectation. All the human expectation would explain this very naturally. God says, no, something more profound has happened. A virgin has conceived. A woman with no physical union has a child within her. And the explanation is supernatural. God has placed that child within her. The Holy Spirit has brought this about. What is in Mary is the product of God's divine activity. And the angel isn't done. He continues. He says that she will bear a son, and you, Joseph, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Very important uh, literary work going on here. When the angel first addresses Joseph, if you look at your Bibles, you notice what he says. Joseph, son of David. It's reminding Joseph that he is one of a number of legal descendants of the great King David, one of whom someday would have a legal son who would be the second coming of David, the great or greater son of David. So he's reminding him of his own lineage. And then when he says, you, you, Joseph, you will call his name Jesus, that is a cultural expression indicating you are going to adopt this baby and you are going to name him as your own legal son and heir. Do you feel the drama of this dream? Here's what's going to happen. Not only are you not going to divorce her, you've been chosen because you're a son of David. You're going to adopt this child. You're going to name him as your own, and he will become, by legal right, a son of David. Here's the point. Everything natural points in the opposite direction. The only explanation for Joseph of Nazareth adopting by name Jesus of Nazareth is divine revelation. No man in this culture would do what he is going to do apart from God sending an angel to tell him to do it. There is no explanation. This isn't a sappy hallmark ending. This is not what this is. This is a man doing the opposite of what everything natural within him inclines him to do. And the only explanation for that is divine revelation. You, Joseph, you will not only not divorce her, you will adopt this child, you will give him your name, you will give him your heritage. He will be a son of David with all of the possibilities that that heritage brings to mind. For this name, Jesus, he informs Joseph, which means Yahweh is salvation, is appropriate because this child will save his people from their sins. Consider the journey that's been traveled just so far in the passage from a scandalous moment of immorality and illegitimacy. The angel declares this child is going to be a son of David named by you is going to be the ultimate savior who will actually rescue the people from their sins and all of the consequences that their sins brought about. Remember, all Joseph knows is that his betrothed is pregnant. Put yourself in his shoes for a moment. What would incline you to name the child Jesus? Yahweh is salvation. What would incline you to marry this woman and face public scandal yourself and take that on yourself? There is no human explanation. The point Matthew is making is this divine revelation is the only thing that makes sense culturally to this story. Likely, verses 22 and 23 are a continued quote. It doesn't have that in the ESV. Commentators differ. Either it's a continued quote of the angel or Matthew is providing his own commentary. 
But in either case, it says the same thing. All this, all this about Jesus took place, in verse 22, to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. This is Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. So the sign that God gave to the king of Israel that he would indeed be the one to deliver his people from their enemies was that in the future there would be a confirming impossible truth that a virgin would conceive and he would be God with us. And it would confirm that God had indeed desired to rescue his people. So he's saying this This plan, Joseph, has been set in motion throughout the ages. 700 years ago, this plan was set in motion. And this child is going to be the one predicted, the one born of a virgin. Even more miraculous than Sarah giving birth in her own age is Mary giving birth without any human union at all. Supernatural glory associated with the birth of Jesus. It's designed to impress on us the reality of his identity as God the Son, the divine Savior, who would indeed save his people from their sins and be God with us. The angel interrupts Joseph's dilemma with divine revelation. Into this dilemma, a miraculous revelation takes place. It's given by a supernatural messenger. It contains the promise that Jesus will be a legal son of David, a status that Joseph could give him, meaning that he could be the heir of David's throne, a new king. And this king will save his people, the angel says, from their sins, the sins that had alienated them from God, the sins that had led to their exile, the sins that had exposed them to the evil powers of their enemies, the sins that traced all the way back to the first man and woman who rebelled against God. These sins were the cause of all the grief and suffering in the world. They were the great barrier between mankind and its maker. Because of sin, there was no hope of paradise after death, just as there was no hope of ultimate comfort in this broken world. The same dilemma that Joseph had before him was, more importantly, the dilemma that every human being had before them, that human ingenuity could only choose between two bad options. Enjoying making the most of a broken world and heading into condemnation, or trying some religious path that will likewise lead to disappointment and dismay because God cannot forgive without some kind of payment for sin. So this revelation is God declaring there is a solution, Joseph, to this dilemma. The solution is the baby in Mary's womb, a baby not made by the will of man, but by God himself coming to earth as a man to save his people and to dwell with them. This leads finally to the decision. Joseph wakes from this (laughs) sleep and verse 24 records, when Joseph woke, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife But Matthew accents again just to make sure the point is clear. The point of the story is there is nothing natural about Jesus other than his human nature. He knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And to conclude the story, he called his name Jesus. Now, I don't think it's the main point of the story, but it is worth commenting on the righteousness of Joseph and his faith. It's interesting, throughout the scriptures, God's sovereignty, his absolute power to fulfill his purpose, is is never set in contradiction with the obedience of his people, the faith of his people. And you look throughout the scriptures, God's sovereignty receives ultimate glory for anything that he does. Any salvation that he achieves, is ultimately the glory goes to God alone. But it's not a contradiction with the way he uses faith-filled and obedient people like Joseph and Mary to fulfill that purpose. In this case, it's worth commending Joseph because he trusts 
a dream as being actually a revelation of God and takes on himself the, the inevitable shame and scandal of marrying Mary and claiming this child as his own and all that that would assume in the culture in order to be obedient and be the means of God putting this child in a home that is of the lineage of David so that all of his promises could be fulfilled about David having a son who would sit on his throne. Now, ultimately, God brought that about. But it is it's worth commending the faith of Joseph. It simply says, he woke and he did, as the angel commanded. And it's worth noting for us, because though none of us are called to be the earthly father of Jesus Christ, we are called to be his people on earth. And though God will save and rescue people through Jesus in this world, we are called to be the means of God proclaiming that message. And like Joseph, we have a human response to God's divine initiative. And we are also called to fulfill the role that God has set for us. It's worth commending Joseph, just like it's worth commending Mary as, as a godly young. She is not divine. She is not worth any prayers being prayed to her. She has no divine power. But as a godly sister in Christ, she, she is a, a, a worthy model of emulating her faith and her humility, just like Joseph is a worthy model of emulating his faith and self-sacrifice to do what God had called him to do. But the point of the story is not Joseph's righteousness. And too often, I think we read this story that way. Good for Joseph. Amen, good for Joseph. But that is not the main point of the story. The main point of the story is the only explanation for Jesus' birth and home is supernatural confirmation. Why does that matter? Why does it matter that Jesus was born of a virgin? Why does it matter that he fulfilled scripture? Why does it matter that an angel had to convince an otherwise righteous man to do the unthinkable and marry this woman? Why does any of that matter? Why is it relevant to us? Why is this relevant? Have you ever wondered that? Why does the virgin birth really matter? Why does it matter that there was angels? Why does it matter that all these things took place uh, with kind of angelic visitation? Why, why does it matter? Why does it matter that there had to be this kind of divine announcements around his birth? Why does that matter? Because the most natural thing in the world for anybody who had seen Jesus was that he was an ordinary man. And yet the things that he claimed for himself and that God claimed for him were extraordinary salvation. But you have to believe that God endorsed Jesus as his chosen savior for sinners or else sinners could find themselves believing in just another false prophet, just another false hope religion. How do you know that Jesus can actually save you from your sins? How do you know that? You have sins. I have sins. We've all committed sins this week that alienate us from God and would keep us out of heaven because God is holy and just. How do you know that Jesus can actually finally save you from your sins? How do you know that? Well, one reason we know that is that only God could have orchestrated the circumstances of his birth. Why is the birth of Jesus so important? It was God's way of confirming from the very beginning, this boy comes from me. This child comes from me. And if he comes from God, then all that he claims to be and to do is representing God. You see why that's important? Here's why the virgin birth is so important. Here's why the, the angels interrupting Joseph's dilemma is so important. It is God declaring, this boy comes from me. He has my divine stamp of approval. Angels, real angels from God, affirm his legitimacy as a product of the power of God uniting to human flesh. It's all to confirm to us that the faith you place in this one to be God with us and the Savior of sinners is well placed. 
because it comes with the affirmation of God himself. Now, as Americans, and I've said this multiple times, but I just want to keep pressing it onto us, we tend to think that it's easy for God to forgive sins. We tend to think that it's natural for every living, breathing person to end up in heaven. That is not the worldview of the Bible. The worldview of the Bible is sinners who ignore and reject God have good reason to doubt that God will ever forgive them. That's the worldview of the Bible. Sinners who have neglected their maker have good reason to question any promise of eternal life and any hope of a future beyond death. They have good reason to doubt that God would never want to draw near to them. That's the assumption of the Bible. So God assumes, since we are reasonably aware of our own sinfulness, that we would wonder whether it's possible that promises of forgiveness can actually prove true, would actually be from God. The Bible assumes that we would need some confirmation because the Bible assumes that we are reasonably aware of our own sin. And if we are reasonably aware of our own sin, we should want some divine accreditation of the one who says he will be the savior of sinners. And here we have it. When when we sing that song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, You know what we're saying? If I could just paraphrase. Listen to what the formal and approved representatives of God declare. That's what we're saying. When we say, oh, holy night, and and the star, you know, over little town of Bethlehem. You know what we're saying? We're saying, listen to what the cosmos itself under the control of God affirmed about this baby. Now, it's not poetic, but because we're so used to the poems, we can miss the point. The fact that God's angels affirmed him as the Messiah was a way of God saying, this is the Messiah. The fact that he was born of a virgin is God saying, only God could have brought this about. The fact that a a man chose to reject all cultural inclinations and marry this woman and bestow on this baby his own legal name is a way of God saying, I interrupted history. This wasn't some human savior who came up with some human solution to sin. This was a divine savior that came with divine approval that was announced with divine messengers and declared, this is the actual, formal, official savior of the world. Any sinner who believes in him has God's absolute promise affirmed by angels and revealed in the virgin birth that God will indeed save the sinners who trust in him. I was buying Christmas presents a little while ago, and one of the products I was looking at, there was, there was one product, and it had a sticker on it, like a little plastic sticker that I could just imagine being ripped off within the first, you know, two hours. And another product had this more heavy-duty looking, you know, product label on it. I don't know if it was metal, it was some heavy-duty plastic at least, but it just looked a lot more official. And maybe you've seen quality products and they they have like metal stamped on them. And you know, okay, that's that's quality, that's official. This, This indicates its quality. That's what the virgin birth is doing for Jesus. It's like a heavenly stamp of divine affirmation. This is the one. It was impressive that Sarah had a baby when she was 90 years old. Very imp- Clearly, God was moving. God was moving in that baby, Isaac. God was moving. Very impressive that Hannah, having been barren all of those years, suddenly has Samuel. Very impressive that Rachel, having been barren all of those years, has Jacob and Esau. Very, very impressive. Barrenness in Scripture is often the platform, the anticipation of God revealing some profound work he's going to do. But a virgin, well, that exceeds everything else. Angel announcements, oh, that goes even further. A chorus of heavenly hosts, that goes even further. But what's the point of all that? It's to say, God declares he is who I say he is. And in this passage, he's called the one who will save his people from their sins. You know what this passage is meant to do for your soul? It's meant to say this, God says he is can absolutely save you from your sins. He has the 
the heavenly stamp. He, he can save you from your sins. You, sinner, he can save you. You, you Christian, that maybe you've become familiar with the doctrines of grace and some doubt and, and disillusionment has crept into your soul. You, you've wondered, have I failed too often? This divinely approved one is the one who God declares with angelic affirmation. He will save his people from their sins. He will be God with man. God declares. God declares to you. If you look at this last year and you're aware of your sinful acts and thoughts and preferences and cravings, God declares he can save you from your sins. If you look at your idolatry or your anger or your bitterness or your selfishness or your pride or your cravings or your idolatries or your addictions and you're aware of all of those things, is there, is there anyone that God would say could save me? Not, not just some, some low-level religious person who wants to give me a, an ounce of hope and say, I, I think you'll be forgiven in the end. I, I want to give you my confidence that it'll be okay. But that, that's worthless. I, I want to know from God, how could I know from the God who is God that there is a Savior who will actually forgive me? Will you look at the otherwise ordinary river of the birth of Jesus and you find the gold of God's affirmation? He will save his people from their sins. Let me give you three responses and application. Three responses. We'll go through them quickly. Three responses that we can have as human beings to the birth of Jesus, the virgin birth, the miraculous attendance, messengers from heaven coming to announce who this baby is. Three responses. The first is doubt. Doubt. And I, I, I wanted to include this, uh, not because I think it's a majority of people here, but there could be some of you here who doubt who Jesus is. You, you've heard enough uh, atheistic comedians that mock religion and talk about the birth of Jesus as a God-man, as some kind of ridiculous story, and that begins to seep into your thinking, it's possible you could be here. And, and if you're under 30, say, and you're a millennial, uh, this is the normal culture you live in, where these kind of, these kind of religious descriptions of angels and a, a baby who didn't have a human father are just absurd, let me just appeal to you. If, if you have doubt about Jesus being who he says he was, let me just encourage you to consider something. Is it really possible? Is it really possible that this world with all of its glories and nature and science and the cosmos and the sun that rises every day and the planets that always stay in the same course of action, is it really possible that all of those things don't have some designer? And if there is a designer who put all of that in place, is it really so impossible that he could interrupt all of those things to announce a savior to bring his own creatures back to him? I mean, if I can say this without being blasphemous, if you were the one who created this whole galaxy and kept in place all of the billions of galaxies of stars that are out there, isn't it possible that you could figure out a way to interrupt normal processes to announce the most important event in history? I mean, isn't that what you would do? Wouldn't you maybe break the pattern a bit for the biggest deal in human history? Would that really be so hard if you could hang the stars and make sure the sun comes up at the right time and there's not constantly uh, shifting plates that break up the world at any given moment? Wouldn't it be the most likely thing in the world that if your very own divine sun was coming, you would maybe direct a few stars and send a few angels and perhaps even do it in a way so that he was not a normal human child in his conception? Wouldn't that be a pretty normal thing for an all-powerful God to do? So if you doubt, if you doubt the reality of Jesus, just, just look up, look at the stars, look at the sun, and ask the question, if you made all of that, wouldn't this seem reasonable to do? And if it would seem reasonable to do, then wouldn't you consider believing it? Consider that God did interrupt the natural course of things to get your attention. Do we really think it would have gotten our attention if this had just been a normal baby with no angels? Wouldn't it be actually kinder of God to get our attention 
by interrupting some normal patterns that we get used to? I think it would. Let me encourage you, if, if you have been affected by doubt, it weaves its way through the, the comedians and cultural satire against Christianity, let's let the stars be more impressive than the average comedian. They've been around longer, and there's more of them, and they're more impressive. It takes nothing to say, how ridiculous is it that there could be a virgin birth? It takes nothing to do that. It takes a lot to make stars. Which person should you doubt as having had a better idea of what's actually going on? I would encourage you to doubt the doubters. They've only been around, I don't know, 60 years. What could they possibly know anyway? We might doubt him. If we doubt him, we cannot receive the salvation he provides. But if we believe him, he will save those people from their sins. You might also be distracted from him. I think this is probably far more common. We can be distracted by the familiarity of Christmas. Brothers and sisters, let me encourage us, urge us, don't be distracted from the glory of Jesus. How foolish, how foolish for a miner to wander past the river in which he knows there is gold. He believes there is gold. He would not deny there is gold and yet not go in there and get the gold. How ridiculous would that be? It's one thing if you don't believe it's in there, but if you do believe it's in there, then wouldn't you get down on your hands and knees and start pulling up handfuls and examining it to enrich your life? And isn't there something to be seen in the birth and the glory and the affirmation of Jesus who is the one who saves you from your sins. Don't be distracted from him. Engage in the details. Meditate on it. I mean, just think about it over and over and over again. Think about the passage over and over and over and over again until you begin to marvel at it. And then marvel at it until you reach a point where you begin to worship him. Don't be distracted from him. By the ordinariness of the Christmas tale, consider, if you believe it, it is worth digging into. You might be distracted from him. And finally, what I pray is the case, we should be delighted in him. We should be delighted in him. The opposite of doubt is not just affirmation. It's not just a kind of mental belief. Uh, the opposite of distraction is not just mental attention. It's delight. It's joy. It's rejoicing. It's, it's exalting and magnifying and, and loving. That, that's why I think we see these stories of the angels rejoicing. We're going to hear next week about an old woman in the temple who rejoiced at the coming of Jesus. Isn't it good news to be delighted in that God himself put his divine stamp of approval on Jesus and declared he will save his people from their sins. He will be God with us. We delight in him. This is the Savior. This is the one who rescues us from sin. He conquers the power of that sin that is so obvious in your life. We can bring our sins to him. And in his perfect life and death, he removes them as a barrier between you and God. Let us delight in him. He is our savior. He is God with us. He is our king. He is worthy of all of our trust and worship. Consider what he is for you. Consider that this book was written for you. Consider that when he says he saves his people from their sins, he means you. He saves you, John and Aubrey and Mike and Susan. He saves you from your sins if you've believed in him. Perhaps it's a sin of your past that a shame is still present in that, that memory and, and yet he saves you from that sin. Perhaps it's a worry about a sin of your future. Remember, this is the God who knows your past, present, and future and saves you from all of your sins to bring you into God's presence. Perhaps it's a current battle with a sin. He is the savior of sinners. With divine affirmation, he removes the guilt of that sin. As surely as the sun rises in the morning, 
Because the one who commands the sun to rise is the same one that banishes your guilt as far as the east is from the west. That's why it's important for his birth to be affirmed as a divine event so that our confidence is not merely in some religious mantras, not really some historical tradition, or not even in our sense of our own level of faith, but in the absolute objective certainty that this one God declares will save his people from their sins. Let us delight in him. Let us glory in him. Let Christmas Day fill our hearts with thoughts of Christ for whom it is named. And let his name well up in our songs and in our prayers and rejoicing there is no one better than him. There is no one more precious than him. There is no news more glorious than his news. Charles Spurgeon said, Jesus is not a grain of gold, but a vast globe of it, a priceless mass of treasure, such as heaven and earth cannot excel.